is effectively nailing the, the right. Can you hear us? Okay, very good. Okay, so Boram, you will talk about machine learning prediction and compression of lattice QCD observables. Uh, yeah, but now we lost. Hi. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. We lost the screen. Let me try to share my screen again. How about now? Okay, good. Thank you. Let me try to maximize the presentation. Can you still see my screen? No. Um, Before was better. No. Yeah. Maybe. Um, screen. So you can still see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good morning and good afternoon. I'm Boram Yun. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing such a nice workshop. Um, today, I'm going to talk about machine learning prediction and compression of lattice QCD observables. Um, here are the contents of my talk. Um, after a short description of the correlation between the lattice QCD observables, I show you a machine learning prediction of lattice QCD observables and a machine learning regression algorithm on let quantum, quantum annulars. Then I'll present a data compression algorithm uh, based on machine learning for lattice QCD data and conclude. First is the correlation in lattice QCD observables. Machine learning is basically a data-driven correlation analysis. So it is important to understand the correlation of data we want to deal with. Um, here's a short, uh, very short this introduction to the lattice QCD. Uh, lattice QCD is a non-perturbative approach to solving quantum chromodynamics and to put uh, QCD theory on computers uh, on the lattice QCD, in lattice QCD, uh, the quark and gluon fields are discretized on a four dimensional Euclidean space-time grid called the lattice. The lattice spacing is A um, and the continuum limit, uh, continuum results are obtained in the limit that a goes to zero. On the lattice, uh, what we calculate is an expectation value of a correlation, correlation functions of some target observable through the Feynman path integration. The integration of the quark fields uh, can be done by hand. And the remaining degrees of freedom is going to be the uh, gluon fields and uh, it is done, uh, oh, and since the integration dimension is order of a billion, uh, the most efficient approach to evaluate the integration over the gluon field is the Monte Carlo method. And in the Monte Carlo method, we generate Monte Carlo samples of the lattices of the gauge fields weighted by the probability distribution of e to the minus gauge action and determinant of the uh, Dirac operator and calculate on simple uh, average of the target observables calculated on each gauge configuration to obtain the expectation value. In the lattice QCD, uh, a large number of observables are measured on each Monte Carlo sample of the gauge field. Uh, and in more than uh, calculations, these observable measurements are computationally more expensive than the gener generation of the lattices. But the statistical fluctuations of the observables are correlated with each other because um, they share the same background lattice. For example, if uh, the pi mass is large on a configuration, then the value of f pi also tends to be large on the same configuration. Such correlation is uh, the key point in applying the machine learning techniques to the lattice QCD data. 
here is an example of such a correlation. Uh, lattice QCD, uh, lattice calculation of one of the CP violating interactions, uh, which is called the uh, chromoelectric dipole moment contribution, requires the calculation of the two point correlation functions in presence of the uh, chromoelectric dipole moment interactions. Uh, but its calculation could be more expensive than the normal two-point correlation functions. But there are correlations. Uh, in this plot, uh, the blue and red data points are the imaginary parts of the gamma-5 projected two-point correlation functions, uh, which we expect some non-zero signal of the CP violating phase when <clears throat> the two-point function is calculated with the chromium interaction. And they are calculated with the same source and sink positions of the nucleons. Here, the y-axis is normalized the correlator, uh, the values, and x-axis is the index of the gauge configurations. And as you can see, uh, they are correlated with each other. When the blue data point is going up or down, uh, the red, red data point is moving in exactly the same direction. Um, this plot shows that if we know the value of uh, the blue data point on the lattice configuration, then we can estimate the value of the red data point on the same configuration. Here's another example of the correlation between the nucleon two and three point correlators, the correlation functions. Um, so as, show, as you can see in these diagrams, uh, the nucleon two point function is creation and annihilation of a nucleon. <clears throat> and, the, and the three point function is the same, but there is a current insertion between the nucleon source and sink. Uh, the plot on the left shows the correlation coefficient uh, between the two and three point functions. Here, the x axis is the two point functions at various source and sink separations. And the y axis is the three point functions for various inserted operators. <coughs> oh. So, here the red means high correlation and yellow means mediocre correlation. As you can see, some channels show a higher correlation than the others. And again, uh, the non-zero correlation indicates that if we know the value of the two-point correlation function on a lattice, uh, then we can estimate the value of the three-point correlation functions as well. Um, now, uh, I'll show you how we can design the structure of the machine learning prediction of the lattice QCD observables. Basically, uh, the goal is to predict uh, some unmeasured but computationally expensive observables from the values of the computationally cheap observables on each lattice configuration. Um, <clears throat> here's the structure of the machine learning prediction of the lattice QCD observables. Assume that we have a total of M independent measurements. Uh, to make it simple, I'll just assume that we have uh, a thousand configurations. Here, X uh, is some common is a set of common observables, and they are measured on all the thousand configurations. And O is the target observable and it is measured only on the first 100 configurations. We call the first 100 configurations the label data set, and the rest 900 configurations as the unlabeled data set. With the label data set, uh, which have both the common and the target observable, a machine, uh, a machine learning model F can be trained to predict the value of the target observable 
from the values of the common observables. Uh, in the training, the machine, uh, the machine learning model learns about the correlation pattern between the common observable and the target observable and builds a model uh, of the prediction. After the training, one can make the prediction of the target observable uh, for the remaining 900 unlabeled data set uh, using the trained model. Uh, we just feed in the uh, the values value of the common observables on the unlabeled data set, and the model uh, yields the prediction of the target. We typically choose the common observables as some computationally cheap but highly correlated with the target observable, and use this approach to predict the value of the computationally expensive observables. Since the machine learning tr uh, training and prediction is computationally much cheaper than most of the lattice QCD calculations, so this approach could save some computational cost. So uh, we now have the predictions, but problem is that all the machine learning predictions have errors. And uh, this is kind of inevitable because the trend model is obtained empirically and the data used for the training have statistical noise. Here, uh, we use OP as uh, a machine learning uh, prediction of O. And in the lattice QCD, we take a simple average uh, over of the measured observables to obtain the expectation value. But if we take a simple average over the machine learning predictions, um, then uh, the average may not be a good estimator <clears throat> of the observable expectation value of what we want to calculate. For well-trained machine learning model, the prediction is supposed to be around the true answer, but there could be some statistical noise as well as some bias. Here the, we define the bias <clears throat> as the difference between the expectation value of the machine learning prediction and the expectation value of the true answer. Um, for statistical data, the bias can be corrected by using a small portion of the label data set. <clears throat> Here we split the label data set into two pieces, one for training and one for bias correction. Um, and then the unbiased average can be defined as the following equation, OBC. As you can see, the bias correction average has two terms. Uh, <clears throat> the first term is a simple average of the machine learning predictions on the unlabeled data set. And the second term <clears throat> is the bias correction term. Here, the bias correction term is a measure of the difference between the grand truth, the true answer, and the machine learning prediction. And, and it is calculated using the bias correction data set, which has both the, uh, the common observables and target observables. So if you take an expectation value of the OBC, the bias corrected average, it becomes the sum of the expectation value of the uh, prediction of uh, machine learning predictions and the expectation value of the difference between the true answer and the machine learning predictions. So it becomes the expectation value of the target observable, which means that uh, here the OBC is unbiased estimator uh, of the target observable we want to calculate. Um, <clears throat> So, and uh, for independent data, the statistical letter of OBC uh, can be calculated by summing the statistical letters of the two terms in quadrature. And the second term increases the statistical letter of OBC accounting for the size of the prediction letter. Um, if the prediction is exact, the contribution from the second term will be zero. And if the prediction is lousy, 
The second term will have a large variance and will need a large number of bias correction data set to control the error from the bias correction term. In another point of view, I would say that the bias correction term converts the systematic uncertainty of the machine learning prediction errors into a statistical error which we can estimate. Uh, the definition of the bias correction term in the previous page uses only the machine learning predictions on the labeled it unlabeled data set for the central value estimation. And the direct measurements on the labeled data set uh, are used only for the bias correction. But one can include the direct measurements of the labeled data set to improve the observable estimate uh, in an unbiased way. Um, here is the improved the bias correction estimation. Again, it has two terms. Um, uh, the first term is the average over the labeled data set. And the second term is the bias corrected average defined on the previous page. To take an average, uh, one should multiply some uh, weight factors uh, of, uh, for, for each term. And uh, they can be something like a normalized inverse variance of each term. Since the two terms are correlated with each other, the error estimation could be a bit tricky, but one can use uh, something like bootstrap resampling for the error analysis. And uh, binning the data uh, and selecting the bias correction data set in a proper way could make the error analysis easier. Um, so far, uh, we have discussed how to predict uh, the unmeasured lattice QCD observables and how to correct the bias. I also said that the bias correction term I described will increase the statistical error of the final estimate accounting for the quality of the prediction. So the next question is going to be how much error will be increased due to the bias correction term? Uh, the bias correct, corrected average of the observable is given as follows. The variance of OBC uh, is a quadratic sum of the variance of the two terms, uh, just like here. And here, the first approximation uh, is for a small statistical correlation between the two terms. And if we assume that the prediction is good enough to give the same variance of, <clears throat> of the, uh, the direct measurements, which stands for the second uh, approximation, um, the, it becomes, uh, the equation can be simplified as following. And here I want to emphasize that these approximations are required only to explain the definition of the Q value uh, I'm, I'm going to describe. And the bias correction procedure itself uh, does not need any such assumptions. The bias correction works with any larger predictions. It will just give a larger error when larger predictions. Anyway, here the equation shows that um, the statistical error of the bias correct average is basically proportional to the statistical error of the original data, uh, which is obvious. And it is also proportional to the one plus M over NBC times Q squared. Here M over NBC is the ratio <clears throat> between the full data set, the number of full data set and the bias correction data set. And the Q-squared is defined here, is the ratio, is the variance of the machine learning prediction error, which is difference between the O and OP, normalized by the variance of the direct measurement. So it says that the error increase is, is large when variance of the prediction error is large, <clears throat> but the error increase is suppressed 
when the number of bias correction data set is large, <clears throat> which is quite intuitive. So we defined uh, the Q squared as the quality of the machine learning prediction. And when Q -square, Q value, when the Q value is zero, that means the prediction is exact or completely correlated with the direct measurement. And if the Q value is one, that means the prediction is lousy and there is no meaningful prediction uh, statistically. With a proper bias correction, uh, the size of the statistical error of the bias corrected average, uh, the results uh, should be equal to or larger than the statistical error of the direct measurements, the ground truth. And the Q value tells us how much error increase is expected compared to the direct measurement. So if we take the ratio between the uh, standard deviation of the bias corrected average and the standard deviation of the original data, it becomes one plus M over two times MBC multiplied by Q squared. So we can estimate how much error increase is expected due to the bias correction. Here, this table shows some examples of the increase when 20% of data is used for the bias correction. The error increase is proportional to the Q squared. And when Q squared is equal to uh, 0.3, the expected error increase is about 20%. And when Q square is 0.1, uh, the Q value is 0.1, the error increase is only 2.5%. And in real problems, the error increase is even smaller uh, than those, those values because of the autocorrelation. Um, in this plot, uh, the x-axis is Q squared, a y-axis is the error increase due to the bias correction. These are obtained from some uh, data compression studies. I'll explain later, but the bias correction procedure is the same as the prediction problems. Here, the ratio between the full data set and the bias correction data set was eight. <clears throat> And if we insert the A to the, uh, the equation we just derived, it becomes one plus four times Q squared. But as you can see, the data points are closer to the one plus two times Q squared. This is because, uh, because of the autocorrelation of data. In lattice QCD, we measure multiple times on, uh, on a gauge configuration at different source positions or different random seeds uh, to increase the statistics. So there is autocorrelation, uh, but bias, correct, bias correction data set uh, can be chosen such that they have less correlation. Um, for example, uh, if we measure a total of 32 sources per configuration, we can take four out of them as the bias correction data. In that case, the bias correction data set have less correlation than the original data set. And the error of the bias correction term scales better uh, than the error of the original data. Um, now I'll show you some examples of the machine learning predictions uh, for the lattice scarcity of the bubbles. The first example is the lattice QCD calculation of the neutron electric dipole moment. So the neutron EDM uh, is a measure of the distribution of the positive and negative charges inside the neutron. And non-zero neutron EDM violates uh, the CP symmetry. And these are uh, leading order effective Lagrangian of uh, the CP violating interactions at hadronic scale. Uh, in this example, we're interested in the lattice QCD calculation of the quark chromoelectric dipole moment term, which is a quark bilinear operator in a tensor structure uh, interacting with the gluon field. On the lattice, uh, the calculation of the neutron EDM contribution uh, from chromoedm requires the calculation of the quark propagators 
in presence of the chromatin interactions. Uh, but it can be done by modifying the, uh, the Dirac operator with a small EDM, chromo EDM tool. It also requires a calculation of the pseudo-scalar operator because of the mixing. Here, the point is that the chromo EDM or pseudo-scalar quark propagators are more expensive than the normal QCD operator, the normal QCD propagators. But uh, there are correlations between the regular QCD two-point functions and chromodium or Stoskala two-point functions. This plot, this is the plot you have seen at the beginning of my talk. It shows a clear correlation uh, between uh, the two-point, the regular QCD two-point functions and the chromodium two-point functions. So we can train the machine learning training machine learning model to predict the CP violating two-point correlation functions. Uh, here is the training setup. We trained a boosted distant tree uh, regression algorithm to predict the two-point function, the values of the two-point functions of the chromodium and pseudo-scalar operators from the values of the regular uh, QCD two-point uh, uh, two-point functions for each measurement. After training the model on 70 configurations, uh, we made the predictions on 280 configurations of the unlabeled data set and performed the bias correction with 50 configurations. Here, these distributions <clears throat> show the distribution of the original data in yellow bars and the motion uh, the prediction letters in dark brown. As you can see, um, it shows that the distribution of the prediction error is much narrower uh, than the uh, statistical fluctuation of the original data, which indicates a good prediction. Um, I'll talk about the, the regression model uh, just a little bit. Here are the final results obtained uh, from a boosted distant tree regression. But we tried a few different regression algorithms on various lattice QCD data. What you found is that for most of the applications, the simple linear regression works pretty well. It even requires uh, uh, only an order of 10 configurations uh, to train uh, because of the simple nature of the model. And there are a few applications uh, that uh, some nonlinear model uh, out outperforms the linear model. And here the chromo EDM operator is one of such example. So far, we did not find any example that shows significant improvement by using neural network based regression algorithms. But of course, uh, we did not study uh, with the neural nets extensively, but it might need more training data and a bigger input data set to learn about uh, the subtle nonlinear correlation with the neural nets. Um, this plot shows the CP validating phase extracted from the two point correlation functions. Here, the red data points are the direct measurements, and the blue data points are machine learning predictions. Uh, through the bias correction procedure, the error bars of the blue data points include uh, the statistic systematic error of the exact machine learning predictions. In the case of the chromidium, um, as you can see, the blue and red data blue and red data points are almost the same. <clears throat> uh, but the computational cost of the blue data points is much cheaper uh, than the red data points. We also applied the same prediction uh, for other lattice QCD observables, and they show quite promising results. Here the left plot uh, shows the prediction of the nucleon three-point functions from the two-point functions. Uh, 
<clears throat> the left column shows the direct ground truth, the direct measurements, and the right hand side uh, column uh, shows uh, their machine learning predictions. And the plots on the right hand side shows the prediction of the FS measure on distribution amplitude on upper plot and the K on quasi PDF of, uh, on the bottom. And here are the predictions. Uh, here we predict the observables at quirk displacements of four uh, from the smaller uh, quirk displacements. The red data points are the ground truth and green data points are the machine learning predictions. As you can see, they are the same, which means um, there is high correlation between them. Um, next, I'll show you some machine learning algorithms we developed on D-Wave quantum annulars for lattice QCD data. Uh, the first one is machine learning regression algorithm for the prediction of lattice QCD observables. The key, I, the key idea is following. Uh, most of the machine learning algorithms involve optimization problems to find the best model parameters describing the training data. And the D-Wave quantum annular uh, can be used as a fast and accurate optimization algorithm for these problems. The D-Wave quantum processor realizes the Ising spin system at very low temperature of about 50 uh, millikelvin, um, it performs uh, the quantum annealing. Here the Ham here's the Hamiltonian. Uh, there are two terms, one with the coefficient of A and the other one with the coefficient of B. Here the first term is a simple alignment in extraction. And the second term is the Ising model Hamiltonian. And here on the right hand side, uh, this plot uh, shows the coefficient of the two terms. Uh, blue is A and red is B. At the beginning of the annealing, the coefficient of the Ising model Hamiltonian is turned off and spins are aligned in the X direction. And as the, as the, <coughs> the annealing uh, and the so, and then it slowly turns on the second term while the turning of the first term. And in the end, uh, uh, the spin system will align to one of the near ground solution of the Ising model Hamiltonian. And we can, <clears throat> and we can read it off as a solution of the optimization problem. On the D-wave quantum annular, we can set the coupling parameters, the H and J in this equation, uh, so that we can use the quantum annealing to solve a specific optimization problem we want to solve. If we can write down the problem in the form of the Ising model. And each annealing takes only about uh, 10, order of 10 microseconds. So, it can solve an NP-hard optimization problem in a very short time. We designed the regression algorithm based on the sparse coding, uh, which is an unsupervised machine learning technique. Uh, first set of input vectors of X um, in D dimension, uh, it finds a matrix phi and uh, the, uh, a minimum number of non-zero coefficients A, uh, which is reconstructing uh, the input data as the following equation. Um, this is a linear equation <coughs> and the problem can be written as the following optimization problem. Um, if we find the phi matrix and A vectors minimizing the reconstruction error and the number of non-zero coefficients. Uh, so yeah, this is the problem finding the optimal solution. 
And here the difficult part is the optimization in A because the L0 norm makes the problem highly non-complex. Um, the A optimization part can be mapped onto the D wave through the following transformation. And in this way, we can solve the optimization in A using uh, D wave, while the optimization for phi is done on classical computers. On the D wave, A becomes uh, uh, the spin up or spin down state. So it is restricted to a binary variable. Then we designed the regression model as an in-painting problem. Here the left figure shows the original one and I removed some pixels in the center figure. And then using the NVIDIA's machine learning tool, I made some, I made the machine learning algorithm to in-paint the mixing pixels on the right. We can do the similar thing with the sparse coding. If we reconstruct uh, an image with the missing pixels, uh, the sparse coding finds the most plausible basis vectors explaining the existing pixels. And it naturally fills up the missing pixels with the correlation pattern it learned from the training data. Here is the algorithm. The goal is to find uh, the prediction of y from the x values. And the basic idea is concatenating uh, the vector of x and y in a one uh, big vector and obtain the phi matrix encoding the correlation between the x and y on the training data set. For the data set uh, with a non y value, um, we, <clears throat> we make the same concatenated vectors with some initial guess of y, which could be the average value of y, and feed it to the sparse coding. The reconstruction uh, from the sparse coding replaces the initial guess of y with its predictions, like the impending problem. We applied the algorithm for the prediction of the <coughs> CP validating phase of the chromium calculation. And this plot uh, shows the prediction error in the y-axis as a function of the number of qubits in the x-axis. As you can see, the current performance is limited by the number, uh, by the maximum number of qubits on D-wave machine, but the results look promising. Um, another interesting use of D-wave is data compression. Um, <clears throat> in the lattice QCD simulations, we produce petabytes of data, but they are correlated with each other and we can reduce the strategy space by exploiting the correlation. Also, in most lattice QCD data analysis, reconstruction error is sufficiently smaller than the statistical fluctuation is good enough. So Lucy data compression is a viable approach. Here is the algorithm. <clears throat> the goal is to find a matrix phi and binary coefficient A that are precisely reconstructing the D-dimensional input vector X as the following linear equation. Here, A, E, a vector can be stored in n q uh, number of binary bits uh, because they are binary variables. And one can consider the A as a lower dimensional representation of the original vector X. And by storing the A vectors, uh, storing the A vectors instead of the X floating point numbers and the X vectors, one can compress the D floating point numbers into NQ number of bits. Um, and again, the phi matrix encodes the correlation pattern of the original data to maximize the compression performance. 
And such a solution of phi and A can be obtained by solving the following optimization problem. <clears throat> and such a solution of phi, see, no. And the finding optimal solution of A vectors is an NP hard problem because it is binary optimization. But we can solve it using D wave quantum annular. Um, again, the Luigi compression could make the reconstruction biased, but we can remove the bias using a small portion of the original data. And we compared the new binary compression algorithm with other conventional machine learning approaches of the bottleneck of the encoder uh, with fully connected neural net and the principal component analysis. In the case of the autoencoder, we can infer the size of the uh, bottleneck to be small. And we train the machine learning uh, machine to compress the original data uh, to a small number of codes in the middle and to reconstruct it reconstruct the origin data precisely from the small number of codes. The principal component analysis defines an auto, autonomal, orthogonal linear mapping uh, of the original data to a new PCA space, uh, which are uncorrelated. And the new variables are ordered by their contributions to the variance of the data set. So we can reconstruct the original data only with the first few principal components for highly correlated data set. We apply the algorithm to the vector and actual uh, three-point correlators of the 16 time slices. Uh, the correlation pattern is plotted here. And the pl two plots on the right uh, shows a reconstruction error, uh, reconstruction error of the <clears throat> of the new algorithm in blue data points and, uh, and do those of the other compression algorithms based on PCA and neural network to encoder in green and red data points. As you can see, the new, and here the X axis is the number of storing bits. <clears throat> As you can see, the new binary compression algorithm <coughs> shows much smaller reconstruction error than the others. Also, by comparing the upper and the lower plots, you can see that the reconstruction error of the vector data is much smaller than the reconstruction of the actual data because of the, because of the higher, higher correlation in the vector channel. And we came back to the error analysis. Uh, this is a logic compression algorithm. So the reconstruction is not exactly the same as the original data. But we can apply the bias correction error, uh, bias correction. We can apply the bias correction uh, I described before to make sure that uh, the reconstruction error does not introduce any bias in the analysis. Problem is that the bias correction increases the statistical error. And this equation shows the <clears throat> how much error will be increased. And as you can see on the right, the typical range of the Q-square value is around 10 to minus two to 10 to minus three. And when Q-square is equal to 10 to minus two, the expected error increase is 2.5%. And when it's 10 to minus three, the error increase is expected to be uh, around 0.25% which is uh, tiny. So we can say that the error increase due to the bias correction is negligibly small for good logic compression algorithms. <clears throat> the compression algorithm can be used for other purposes. Uh, the first one is outlier detection. When a data set shows a larger reconstruction error, that means the data pattern of the given event uh, is different from the data set used for the training. And it can be marked as anomalous. Another use is, <clears throat> is uh, increasing the effective bandwidth for data movement 
and reducing the number of operations <coughs> number of operation requirements. The relationship between X and A is linear. <coughs> so one can replace the operations in X by the operations in A uh, uh, in, in the single bit coefficients uh, of A. Of course, the computational cost is much cheaper in the A space. Um, so here is a summary. Um, so we employed the machine learning to predict uh, the value of the unmeasured observables from the measured observables. And a bias correction algorithm is proposed to, to, <clears throat> to uh, convert the systematic uncertainties of the machine learning prediction to statistical errors. And we developed a new uh, regression algorithm utilizing quantum annulars and show the promising results. And also developed a new machine learning based bias uh, compression algorithm, uh, which is also utilizing the quantum annular for binary optimization. Thank you. Thank you, Baran. Other questions? Uh, let me see here. No. Uh, if there are questions online, please uh, raise your hand so we can see you. I was here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi. Thanks for the nice uh, presentation. I would just, I mean, just like curiosity, I would like to ask, I mean, you have used this method in, um, um, uh, for the chromo, chromo uh, magnetic uh, electric type for moment. Yeah, chrome. Yeah, could, yes. you, could you please uh, comment on uh, whether this could also be used in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, electric type of moment induced by the feed up term? Electric example moment of what? I mean, the heat up term. I mean, uh, um, the QCD heat up term. I mean, whether. Oh, QCD term. Oh, yes. Yeah, the um, for, the dimension four, I'm not sure. So, should um, QCD. Yeah, there are some applications uh, for the QCD term. Um, but here the problem is that. In case of the QC there are term, oh yes, definitely we can use this approach. <clears throat> so in case of QC there are term, what we so the typical approach is uh, correlating the this cloning observable, which is GG total, with uh, the vector three point correlators of uh, vector current, and. Uh, there is high correlation between the two-point correlation functions and the three-point correlation functions, especially in the vector channel. So it is we can we can calculate the three-point correlators of the vector current uh, by using uh, from the uh, two-point correlators. So there is no point predicting the values of the GG twiddle because. Now the calculation of the QC theta term itself, the GG tweet is relatively cheap on the lattice because it's gluing observable. But we can predict the three-point correlation functions of, of the neutron. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, but you have to okay. come here because we... Back on. Hi, Boran, and Hi. thank you for the nice talk. I had a couple of questions regarding the bias correction 
you had uh, mentioned that you took you took it in quadra quadrature right the op and op minus so yeah bias correction yeah <clears throat> the error in the bias correction when you write so you are uh, oh yeah. yes yes so there you have you could have cross correlations between uh, so you're ignoring the the correlations between op and o minus op terms so so in this equation yes i ignored the correlation because the correlation is small but the but in the actual error analysis <clears throat> i uh the all the correlations are taken into account uh, through the uh bootstrap analysis just a sec i think yeah okay continue so yes so in this equation, the equation given here, yeah. I ignore the correlation between these two, two terms to define uh, the Q value. Uh, and indeed, the correlation between these two terms are quite small uh, and numerically. But in the error analysis uh, for the final estimates, I use the bootstrap analysis to include every correlation in the final error estimate. Okay. Also, in uh, one of the plots of GA of UD, uh, I think in one you know, of the results that you showed. Um, something like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, yeah. the predicted curve is uh, looks very, uh, I mean, qualitatively, it looks very different from the one in the left hand side. It looks more yes. good on the right. Yes. So in case of the three point and two point correlation functions, uh, the, the strongest uh, correlation is in the vector channel. Yeah. So as you can see, in, in case of vector, um, the two point and three point are highly correlated. The correlation is not very large in case of the axial. So yes, there could be some difference, but uh, first they are consistent with each other within uncertainties. Okay. And second, so there is a better way to predict uh, the actual channel. So in case of, in the calculation of the actual charges, what we use, we usually calculate like a three to five different source and sink separations. So mm -hmm. what I found is uh, predicting the three point correlation functions, not only from the two point correlations, but uh, from, so for example, if we want to uh, predict the value of sourcing separation 10, 12, 14, and 16, then we can predict uh, them uh, from the value of the two point correlation functions and one of the sourcing separations. Then we can predict the rest three sourcing separations uh, from the two point and one of the sourcing separations. And I find that it gives the better uh, prediction performance and cost reduction than predicting only from the two point correlation functions. Okay. And uh, one more, just last question like regarding this uh, three point function that you're computing for the nucleon. Like recently, there was this paper about the pion nucleon terms that can contaminate. Do you think uh, we can use machine learning because to eliminate the effect of the pion nucleon terms? Um, I don't have any idea because um, the analysis is, so what we can use uh, the machine learning is to increase the statistics because the pion nucleon interaction requires a, a high, huge statistics, but yes. and we can use machine learning to increase the statistics, but we cannot model uh, the physics uh, using the uh, machine learning. So, which means that we cannot predict the value of the first excited state term from the machine learning. I don't have any idea how to uh, do the excited state fit with the machine learning. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Are there other questions? I don't see. Okay, if not, uh, we thank uh, we thank Boram again.